Beautiful. Good morning. Grace and peace to you all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. What a delight it is to welcome you all to worship this morning. We are so grateful indeed to Lori, uh, Lori Hamill and Patrick O'Neill, who you can't see, but he's behind here, leading us this morning in worship. Thank you for your presence here. You know, I was sitting in a pew quite early this morning getting ready for the day, and I was thinking as I looked at the weathered pew that I was sitting in, I was thinking of people who have worshipped in this place. People long, long before our time, people who made their way through this church just once as they came to visit this beloved place, and people who wore those seats down week after week. Whoever you are, and for however many times you have sat in these pews, if it's your first or your 50th, know that you are welcome here, because this is where we meet God. This morning, as we worship, we uh, extend a special and caring love and condolence to Mike Lancaster and his wife, Linda, and daughter, Catherine, and son, Kevin, as they grieve Ma uh, Mike's mother's death this week. Um, Mike will be with her, uh, his family as they celebrate her life later this week. And so we're grateful for your presence with us, and we hold you in our hearts, Mike. If you will rise in body or in spirit, so that we might join in our opening litany. We come to worship the Most High God, our refuge and strength. We come to worship the one who protects us, like a father or like a mother, protecting their little ones. We come to worship the Lord who knows our every need, who cares for us at all times, good and bad. May our faith deepen as we worship today. May our trust grow as wide as God's love for us.
Please be seated. At our best, we long to be whole people whose words and deeds are a reflection of the truth within us. We want to be free of pretense and alive to the wonders that we encounter in other people and in God's creation. God is ready to cleanse us and heal us as we confess our sins. Join me now as we pray the prayer of confession that you find printed in the bulletin. There will be a moment of silence for us to uh, enjoy that before amen. Holy One, we confess that we have put our laws to ground ourselves from all fear. We confess that we worry more about our personal losses than we do about the collective good. We confess that we rather focus inward than to look and seek all around us. Forgive us, we pray. By your love and grace, help us bridge the distance that divides us, not only from each other, but with you. Amen. As far as the east is from the west, the psalmist tells us, so far does God remove our transgressions from us. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is God's steadfast love toward those who love the Lord. John 3.16 reminds us, for God so loved the world that he sent his only one, only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Friends, believe the gospel. The gesture is simple, but the meaning is profound. When we extend our hand to our neighbor, we identify with Jesus who extended his life to the point of death and making peace with humanity. Join me as we pass the peace to our neighbors. Are you going to come? I've got three friends up here, and anybody else who feels young at heart and wants to join us, you can. One of these folks is ready for a party because they talked about the prodigal son in their lesson today, and I was thinking it's totally appropriate to wear your party hat to church because God invites us all to worship, right? 
God invites us all for what this party of grace is all about. So I have a question. Have you ever met somebody you didn't know before? Probably. We've all met somebody we didn't know before. And maybe when you meet someone who's brand new, you wonder to yourself, can I be this person's friend? Can this person be my friend? Well, those questions are normal and... What's that? Like John and Joe. Like John and Joe, are they your friends? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, so um, this little book that I love so much, I think gives us an answer to that question, all right? And we're going to see how Elliot does here. He's, he's got a lot of questions about stories, so we'll see if we can, we can get through it, okay? Can you see these pictures, Catherine? It says, little one, whoever you are, Wherever you are, there are little ones just like you all over the world. Their skin may be different from yours, and their homes may be different from yours. And look, there's all kinds of different houses on this picture. Yep, I'm going to need that hand to turn the page. Yeah. See all these different people? Their schools may be different from yours. That's a school. And their lands may be different from yours. That's a house that doesn't look like any houses around here. Their lives may be different from yours, and their words may be very different from yours. I bet you've met people or heard people speak a language that you've never heard before. But inside, their hearts are just like yours. Whoever they are, wherever they are, all over the world. Their smiles are like yours. And they laugh just like you. Their hurts are like yours, and they cry like you too. Whoever they are, wherever they are, all over the world. Little one, when you are older and you are grown, you may be different. Can you imagine? You may be different when you get older. And they may be different wherever you are, wherever they are. It's okay, it's okay. Just in this big, wide world. But remember this. Joys are the same. And love is the same. Pain is the same. And blood is the same. Smiles are the same and hearts are just the same wherever they are, wherever you are, wherever we are, all over the world. You can remember that when you feel sad about something, somebody who's very different from you might feel sad about something too. And when something makes you happy, The very same thing may make somebody who's not at all like you happy too because really God made us in God's image and so we have God's love and that makes us all similar and all together. And I think that's a helpful thing to remember when life gets hard. I'm glad that you all are here today. I'm glad that we are all together at this great party that God has invited us to to worship So how about this? Let's have a prayer, and then y'all can go hang out. Okay? Let's pray. Will you all repeat after me, too? Thank you, Jesus, Jesus. for loving us us. and creating us us. and calling us good. good. May we remember remember that everyone everyone has your love love and your grace. grace. Amen. I'm so glad you're here. All right, you go. You gonna take your things? You gonna take your hat?
I am so grateful to Abby Oakley for uh, joining me up here in the chancel this morning and helping to lead worship. It's nice to do worship with a local celebrity. Um, <laughs> Curtis is away with family this weekend. Our scripture lesson today comes from the end of the 16th chapter of Luke's uh, Gospel. And before I begin to read the scripture, a little context for you. At this point in Luke's gospel narrative, Jesus has gained a pretty significant following. Some of those following him are amazed by his words and his actions. Some are, in fact, so convicted by what they have heard Jesus teach and seen Jesus do, that they have changed their entire lives in order to follow him. Still others, namely those with positions of religious authority, are questioning deeply and sometimes vehemently what Jesus is doing. 
By the time we get to chapter 16, Jesus has been preaching to this mixed crowd for quite a while. He has demonstrated deep knowledge of the scriptures. He has taught them how to pray. He has healed people on the Sabbath to the great agitation of the religious authorities. And they have, in turn, complained about the company that Jesus keeps, sinners and tax collectors, to name a few of the most unsavory. Jesus has preached about a lost sheep and a lost coin found again, a prodigal son who returned home to the joyful arms of his father. Of course, not everything Jesus says is easy to hear. Not every message is about God's healing and God's amazing unending grace. Some of what Jesus preaches makes us question where we stand or whether we stand in God's holy reign. Case in point, chapter 16 in Luke. Chapter 16 is about wealth and how wealth can so easily throw off our lives of faith in God. Luke tells us outright, the fair audience are lovers of money. So you better believe that when Jesus begins to preach about wealth, their hackles went up. Which makes me wonder, what happens when I preach about wealth? <laughs> really makes me wonder what happens when Jesus talks about money. Do we feel convicted? Inspired? Accused? Annoyed? Guilty? Assured? Worried? Hopeful? However you expect to hear, I want to invite you to set that aside this morning. Because maybe this time we will hear something new when the Spirit whispers into our hearts as we hear God's word for us today. Before I turn to the scripture, will you please pray with me? Your words and spirit, your words are spirit and life, O Lord, richer than gold, stronger than death. Your words are spirit and life, O Lord, life everlasting. And so may your holy word be the bridge today to span the distance between what we long to do and what we actually do as we seek to follow you. We ask humbly in Christ's name. Amen. So listen now as the Spirit speaks to the church today. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus covered with sores who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. Now, in my interpretation that I'm reading right here, it says by his side, but in some interpretations that might be a little closer to the Greek, it says that Lazarus is at the bosom of Abraham. The rich man called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things and Lazarus in like manner evil things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us is a great chasm that has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. 
He said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone raises from the dead. Holy wisdom, holy word, thanks be to God. So I have been thinking about chasms this week about spaces that cannot or will not be crossed. Merriam-Webster defines a chasm as a deep cleft in the surface of a planet or as a marked division, separation, or difference between people. There are so many chasms between people, aren't there? So many reasons that we separate ourselves from each other. And while I believe that Jesus is honing in on one particular division in this story, the division between the rich and the poor, I think that we all struggle with not just what divides us, but the very fact that we find these chasms between each other in the first place. We've heard it again and again. We humans are created for relationship. We're made for community with each other and with God. And it hurts deep within us and within society when we are divided. Sometimes the pain caused by our chasms is personal. Maybe it's a family thing, an estrangement from someone we love, but with whom we no longer see eye to eye. And while we ache to be separated, reconciliation seems impossible. Sometimes the hurt is tribal. That group hurt us. Those people are just wrong. We could never be friends, much less drawn together in beloved community. The chasms between people or groups aren't limited to our personal preferences or desires. Cultural differences create chasms. Ignorance creates chasms. Fear of the other creates chasms. Assumptions create chasms. I think that's very much what we find in our story today. The rich man and Lazarus, while living in quite close proximity, are a world apart. We don't know much about either man in this story. We know that they are aware of each other, though. Lazarus knows of the rich man at whose gate he lies daily, and the rich man knows Lazarus well enough to call him by name, In the afterlife, you may have noticed Luke is very intentional by naming Lazarus, but the rich man has no name in this story. We also know that the rich man, of course, has wealth enough to eat lavishly each day and to dress in fine clothing and to own a home. And that is enough to separate him completely from Lazarus, whom we know ached, with untreated sores, and who longed for food enough to feed his belly. And technology just made me lose my place, but we can enjoy these beautiful bells, if you don't mind, as I find my place. Now, I wonder what creates the chasm between Lazarus and the rich man? The easy answer, I think, the surface level answer is that the rich man and Lazarus have nothing in common, right? They didn't run in the same circles. They didn't share any interests. They didn't do the same things with their lives. Why would they care about each other? How could they have an authentic relationship with each other when their worlds were so different? 
I honestly think that sounds more like an excuse, though, than a reason, an explanation. I think the actual answer runs deeper. And maybe for those of us with roofs over our heads and daily bread on our tables, the answer cuts a little deeper, too. I suspect that the chasm between the rich man and Lazarus has more to do with how the rich man understood his wealth and how his culture understood his wealth. I suspect that the rich man had bought into the pervasive notion that wealth indicates worth. I suspect that the rich man believed his riches were a sign of God's favor, God's blessing. And if riches are a sign of God's blessing, then what is poverty than a result of God's curse? I think that's why the rich man is shocked when he finds himself in hell while Abraham holds Lazarus close in his arms in the afterlife. This is a slippery slope, isn't it? To understand wealth as a sign of God's blessing. It makes it so much easier to blame the poor for their suffering. After all, many are quick to assert that Jesus never condemns wealth in and of itself. Jesus never says that it's bad to have money. It's what we do with our money that Jesus cares about. But again, I think that's a surface level way of thinking. And if we just leave it at that, then things might, we might never change. The chasms will never be bridged. Those with wealth might give some away and then just cross off good works on their to-do list. But this text, I believe, demands more. I think this story requires us to consider not only what we do with our money, but how we think and what we believe and what's in our hearts when it comes to our feelings about wealth, whether we have it or not. I remember earlier in this chapter, all about wealth, before he tells this particular parable, Jesus speaks to the Pharisees whom Luke describes as lovers of money. And so Jesus says to them, you are those who justify yourselves in the sight of others, but God knows your hearts. For what is prized by humans is an abomination in the sight of God. When it comes to money, what's in our hearts matters most. In the rich man's eyes, Lazarus has no value. The rich man had no need to love Lazarus, no need to genuinely care about him. Maybe he gave him a few scraps off his table. Maybe he didn't shoo away his dogs when they went to lick his sores. But he certainly didn't love Lazarus. For what could Lazarus do for him? What could he gain from his relationship with a poor, hungry, homeless man covered in sores, loitering at his gate. To the rich man in this story, Lazarus was worthless. Depending on how we look at it, wealth can insulate or isolate us from the neighbors that Jesus calls us to love. The rich man had no need for Lazarus in life, and so he never reached out in authentic, neighborly, holy love. But in death, the tables turn. In death, suddenly, the rich man has great need for Lazarus. It's crass, almost, the way the rich man demands that Abraham send Lazarus to serve him. The rich man still has no love 
for Lazarus. He has a need for Lazarus, but no love. And here's what I believe is the crux of this whole parable, the place where holy wisdom resides. What ultimately makes Lazarus valuable to the rich man is the truth he could never conceive of in life, the truth that God loves Lazarus. At the end of the day, the only value any of us has in life or in death is that God loves us. Isn't that right? The true value of every human being, of every created thing, is the very fact that we are created and loved by God which at the end of the day makes us very, very close to one another. The fact that we are created and loved by God, all of us, is the bridge that spans every single chasm that separates us. Several decades ago, in August of 1965, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. came to Western North Carolina. And he spoke at a church retreat in Montreat Conference Center in Black Mountain. And in his talk, he discussed that day this very parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And he said to those gathered over 50 years ago words that still ring true for us today. He said that the church's challenge is to be as concerned as our Christ about the least of these, our brothers and sisters. And we must do it because in the final analysis, we are all to live together, rich and poor, lettered and unlettered, tutored and untutored. Somehow, we are tied in a single garment of destiny, caught in an inescapable network of mutuality. And for some reason, King said to them and still to us today, for some reason I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. And you can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. This is the way God made the world. We must all learn to live together as brothers and sisters or we will all perish as fools. Before I began today, I asked you to set aside your feelings about Jesus' words about money. And I wonder if you were able. I wonder if you, if we, are able to sit with this story of Lazarus and the rich man and with these words of the modern prophet MLK Jr., and with our relationship with money and our relationship with our families and friends and with our relationships with people that we could never imagine calling friends and see ourselves as part of a holy garment of destiny woven by the great, great weaver of love. I wonder if we could see ourselves as part of a holy story of grace that does not calculate our worth by first checking our bank accounts, or looking at our resumes, or counting the amount of close relationships we have. I wonder if we can see ourselves as God sees us, as part of a beloved whole. I wonder if when we think about the story of the, of the rich man and Lazarus, maybe later today or further on this week, maybe in a year, we will consider the chasms in our lives as unnecessary and unholy divisions that we, in fact, can cross. Because sitting on the other side of those chasms is not a stranger or the estranged, but someone who is loved by God. And after all, sitting across from that person 
on the other side is someone who looks exactly the same. I say this to you in the name of the one who is and who was and who is to come. Amen. This time, if you will rise in body or in spirit, and as those called together as the beloved community of Christ, let us join our voices together in our affirmation of faith. Church, what do you trust? A devout life does not bring, does bring wealth, but it's the rich simplicity of being yourself before God. Since we entered the world penniless, and we'll leave it penniless if we have bread on the table and shoes on our feet. That's enough. Amen. You may be seated. Would you pray with me as we pray the prayer for God's people? Merciful Father, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer, we come to you in prayer this morning with our heads bowed and our hearts opened. Speak to us as we pray that we might receive your message. We count ourselves among your believers, that we come to the service of worship as evidence of our faith and our willingness to call ourselves Christian. Yet we await your message in fear, for we know that the road you ask us to walk is a difficult one. And who are we that we can come before your throne with the boldness to ask your guidance? Lord, as your followers, we know you have expectations of us. Certainly among them are to love our neighbors, to serve others and live our lives according to the teachings of Christ. We think we know our frailties, we think we know our capabilities, and we ask ourselves, how can we possibly live our lives as you would have us live them? We ask this because what we are really are seeking is assurance. For in our hearts we believe, and yes, we know you will provide the answers and the strength so that we might go out into the world and offer ourselves in the service of fellow man. Now we know that living a comfortable life as so many of us in this congregation live is okay in the sight of God. Where we fall short is when we fail to listen to the teaching of Christ and fail to open our hearts and listen to his commandments on how we use these blessings. Do we share them with those whose skin is of a different color or perhaps are unchurched or just because they are not one of us? We are told to look around in this very community of ours to become aware of those dealing with hunger, lacking the bare, bare essentials such as shelter or in need of medical services there are those whose pain comes from being unloved, perhaps dealing with demons we can only imagine. As with the rich man's brothers, we need to listen to the everyday Christian messages. Are we listening? Are our ears and hearts really open? Throughout our lives, we encounter many chasms, some so wide we cannot fathom bridging them. Mercifully, one of God's eternal messages to us, his followers, is that through him all things are possible. Lord, spare us the pain of the uncaring man in the scripture. We pray these things in the name of him who taught us to pray. Our, Our Father, Father, who art who in, in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be, be thy, thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come, thy will, will be done. done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, 
and the, and power, the power, and the glory, glory forever. forever. Amen. Jesus calls on us to follow him. One way in which we respond to this call is to offer our gifts of time, talents, and treasures. Let the ushers come forward and receive our gifts.
whose bounty we have all received, accept this offering of the people, and so follow it with thy blessing, that it may promote peace and goodwill among men, and advance the kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. charge to you all today is to go out into the world that God so loves to be bridge builders, to help us all begin to cross these chasms that separate us. And if stepping out feels like a real act of faith, then you know you're doing it right. <laughs> now may the love of the Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit and the grace of God be with you all now and forever. Amen. Amen. Amen.